Welcome to the Electronics Basics series. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to get notifications. I'm doing a video every day, so make sure you come back again tomorrow. So in today's video, we're going to talk about op amps and comparators. They're very similar and yet very different. And I think it's important you actually understand the difference between them. Here I have three different op amps. This is a single channel op amp, because it's only got one op amp in that package. This is a dual op amp, so there's two in there. And this is a quad op amp. There's four in there. And these are TRI-4. Yeah, MC4558 TO081. Now, op amps and comparators. Why are they different? Why is it important to know? Now, op amps and comparators have both got the same symbol. They both have this triangular symbol like this, and you've got plus, minus, and output, right? So, like this. Same symbol, but they're not the same devices. An op amp has a push pull transistor set up with some resistors and stuff inside, and there's your output here, and you've got another transistor here doing the push-pull, right? So that'd be ground, that'd be plus, whatever that may be. So it's a push-pull output internally to the op-amp. A comparator is an open collector, so you just got that bit only instead. So it's only going to be, as I've shown in previous videos, down to ground, output, um, MPN. Should actually put triangles in there, shouldn't I? MPN, PNP, there's your upper here. So this is a op-amp, that's a comparator. This is an important difference. An op amp is designed to amplify in a linear fashion, very precisely, in a calculable way, so you know exactly what amplification level is. It's meant to be linear. A comparator is a switch, it's on or it's off, and they're designed to work in a saturated method. This is meant to work in a linear method. Very different outcomes. Op amps sometimes don't even like to work in a saturated region. If you, if you are switching the output in an on off fashion, some op amps don't even like that. It can actually damage them and they can overheat because they're not really designed to work that way. I mean, they can work that way. It's an op amp circuit. I mean, you can use them that way. If you're going to do in that kind of situation where you're switching a high low state, use a comparator. Now, obviously, in this case, a comparator is a open collector output, which means it's pulled down to ground when it's active. So in that case, on the output of the actual device, you'd put a pull up resistor to wherever the positive rail would need to be. And that gives you that zero volt and positive state. So op amp circuits, there's loads of op amp circuits available. I mean, if you look on Google and just do a search for op amp circuits, you'll see there's loads of them and different variations. Same thing, there's amplifiers, there's, say, a comparator type of setup. I don't recommend it. I'd recommend using comparator. There's a buffer, so it just passes straight through, which is one of my favorite circuits, actually. And you can do inversion and all sorts of stuff. So you can put a capacitor on the feedback, stuff like that. You can actually use them as filters. There's lots of different ways of using op amps. They're very versatile chips, but... Don't use it as a comparator. <laughs> I mean, like I said, you can, but I don't recommend it. A typical op amp circuit could be just very basic. One of my favourite uses is a buffer, in which case you just get it, feed it back into its input like that. So you get the positive input here, negative here. Well, you know, if you put in one volt here, you'll get one volt out. And it's basically passes straight through. Why would you do that? Well, that's because op amps have a very high input impedance. It doesn't put much loading at all on a circuit under test. So whatever signal we have coming in here, this has a negligible effect on it. It won't really drag it down to ground when like, like a multimeter might be 10 mega ohm in input impedance. This is bigger than that. Could be gig ohms even. You now these have almost no effect at all on a circuit. If you've got a sensitive circuit, you're trying to not affect it, influence it in a new way. And to make sure you get an accurate reading on the output of that, if you want to measure it, you can feed it into the op amp. And then the output from the op amp here will be a low impedance version of the signal you got here. This will be exactly the same signal as that within a really small amount. It might be some very marginal error there. You're talking microvolts error, but it will be high current. That's what the idea of this is, it's a buffer. So it's because it's much higher current. You can then measure this, find the multimeter that affecting your device, which you're testing. Or if you need to amplify a little bit, you could use this as a way of doing that to first buffer it and isolate your circuit, which is feeding this from the amplifier section, any matching you may need to do, that sort of stuff. You could also feed in to a second op amp if you've got like a dual op amp like this one for example you could feed that into your second op amp so there's your buffer and then you can amplify it um, using a divider now do you know how to draw a divider to make it amplify well it has a resistor on the feedback for a start it does that why is it doing that well because we also have a resistor here this is a voltage divider there's actually a way of calculating R1 and R2 values to know what this amplification factor is. You may have 
10k and 1k for example and that will give you a times 10 amplification so to actually calculate this, which you can do quite easily, but this isn't exactly right because I've got 1k and 10k, it's actually not quite the right proportions, but I'm going to talk about this. I mean, really, if you want that to be right, it'd be 1.1k, I think it is. So to calculate the actual gain you're going to get from op-amp, it's actually really too straightforward. You have to 1 plus 1 resistor divided by the other resistor in order to create the ratio. You always have to have the 1 plus, though. That's the interesting part. You have to have this bit on top of it. Now, it's actually... I've actually got these <laughs> level backwards in a way, but anyway... It's R2 divided by R1. So you divide that by that and add on 1 and that shows you how much gain you're going to get. R2, so I'm going to do 10k divided by 1k. We're just going to use k's plus 1. And that's going to give us 11 times gain. And it's actually times 11 with those values, which you might not want. So if you wanted to do an actual times 10 gain, what you need to do is change these visitor values very slightly, which can be tricky sometimes. Sometimes you might need to use multiple resistors or resistors in parallel and just tweak the values a little bit. Like for this example here, this is 11 times gain as I said. You may want exactly 10. In which case you'd want a 10k resistor here and a 1.1k resistor here. If you could do that. Another way you could do it is to actually increase the values by a factor of 10. So if you make this one 100k and then you can make this one 11k. See what i done? That gives us a much better margin. 11k it's something you could potentially get. It'd be much easier to set that up. For example, in this case, you could get a 10k resistor and a 1k resistor. Stick them in series and there's your 11k. Easy. Well, here you can see I've just filled in the formula just so you can see what I'm talking about. The other thing is, op amps can be used from a single rail supply or a split rail supply. So you might have plus or minus 15 volts across the actual op amp, which means you can actually go plus and minus. So you go above and below the zero volt rail. That can be really helpful sometimes, especially if you're doing audio, you might need to do that anyway. But you don't have to use it as a split rail supply. Other things to consider in relation to that is that the op amps often don't go rail to rail. There might be one volt above the minimum and one volt or more below the maximum. Or it could even be worse than that. So another consideration is don't assume that an op amp is going to go right down to zero volts, because it probably won't. But that's when you may consider a rail to rail op amp. You can get ones which get really close to it. That's when you use a split rail and you actually drop the zero volt down to a negative voltage instead on a supply rail, then it can go down to that zero volt position. Now there's lots of different kinds of op amps as well. I should probably mention this. Typically when you talk about op amps, you're talking about a voltage op amp. So these are ones which can take a voltage input and spit out a voltage as well. There's other kinds of amplifiers. Another example is a transconductance amplifier that accepts a voltage in and outputs a current instead. And there's also other ones that take a current in and output a current or input a current, output a voltage. There's lots of different types, but the most common type, as everyone refers to an op amp, is a voltage in and a voltage out. And that's what you mostly see. Now, op amps will generally have a small offset voltage and they're not always perfect. More than op amps are getting better and better all the time. Some op amps have got a trimming option, so you actually got an offset adjustment built into your op amp, so you can actually trim the output. So what I mean by the offset is that with a zero volt input here, so you've got zero volts in here, so negative, positive, and here you've got zero volts coming in. Right? And this is also input as well, which will be called zero volts also. Both input zero, this should be zero, right, on the output. It may not be. Even if you're using a split rail supply, it might be plus 15, minus 15. You should get zero, but not always. You might find that this might be 0 0.0001 volts, or worse than that. It might even be one millivolt out. You know, it might be an order of magnitude worse than that. It might be that, or even potentially worse. Now, if that really small error matters to you, then you might need one which has got trimming. Now, what some have is... A negative offset, positive offset. There's some offset adjustments. So it's like basically what you do is you attach a trimmer to those. I'll just draw it over here. Can you put a well? I was going to draw a physical resistor. Well, it looks like an inductor now. <laughs> and at this point here, because you link those together, and here you'd inject a voltage and you'd make that trimble, right? So you might have you know, your main supply rail or whatever. Let's 15 volts, you know, plus 15 here, and you'll trim it each wire and it will adjust the offset up and down so you can get your true zero volts. A lot of the more modern op amps now don't really need that. In most cases you don't even have to worry about it, even if they do have offset adjustments on the actual chip. Usually you don't need to worry. It depends on how much precision you require. If you need more precision then use a better op amp or you use one with low offset voltage. Look in the data sheet, I'll tell you what they are. If you need a trimmer one, get a trimmer one. You can then tweak it yourself with a potentiometer and get it exactly where you want it.
I've used both techniques myself. If you're enjoying these videos, make sure you click like and click on subscribe and the bell icon if you're not already subscribed. But definitely click like if you're enjoying the videos. There's plenty more to come. I've got loads and loads planned. I've got dozens and dozens of videos planned. So make sure you subscribe. I kind of skipped over this open collector output thing here. That's because I explained in a previous video. Go back and look at my integrated circuits video and I explain about open collector outputs a bit more detail in that one if you need a bit more explanation. So I should explain a bit more about comparators as well whilst I'm thinking about this. Now as I said they're very similar to op amps, they're very similar. They have the same basic operation here. Now another example which is more related to the comparators and op amps as I was saying is to have an input which is voltage referenced. So you'd have the input here going to a actual voltage reference. It could actually be a voltage reference or a zeno diode or something like that. A known value that you want to compare against. So this could be a zeno. It could be say a 5.1 volt zeno for example. So this is a comparator circuit, right? You can use this one op-amp as well, but I don't recommend it as I said. All you need is a voltage reference on one side here. And there's your voltage input which you want to compare against. This one you want to check. And this is the one you actually want to use as your reference. So in this case I've just done a zeno diode circuit. So you've got a 5.1 volt Zener sitting here with a power supply to your power it because you need that. You could use a resistor divider, you could do that too, it depends on what you're doing. If you know your 15 volt supply rails coming in is rock solid, you could do a 3 to 1 resistor divider network instead of having a Zener. It'd be cheaper, it may not be as stable or as reliable. If you've got a known voltage source then it's probably slightly better. Anyway, so you've got a 5.1 volt reference here. When this input here is above 5.1 volts, this output will be positive. When this input is below 5.1 volts, it'll be negative. An op amp will do the same thing, but like I said, they're not really meant for that. They don't like being in that saturation region, they like to run as a linear amplifier. So that's a typical kind of comparator circuit you would use. The other thing I should also mention, because these are open collector outputs, this would need a pull-up resistor to the positive row, whatever that may be. Otherwise it won't pull up, it'll only pull down. You need to think of those things. So don't forget to check out the rest of the Electronics for Beginners video series. It's a playlist down the bottom just over there somewhere. There's also a place YouTube thinks you should like over here and subscribe link over there. Make sure you check all those out. I've got lots of videos. Make sure you go and watch them. Lots of repair videos as well if you want to get into that. Okay, catch you later. Bye.